so thankful for God and his faithfulness to me and my family, to our church. It's a joy to be here again this morning, to be able to be here this morning. I know some aren't able to be here. I know they would love to be able to be here, but the circumstances have dictated that they cannot be here. And so we rejoice in being able to gather with the saints, set under the teaching of God's word, and that's what we're going to do this morning. So I invite you to, uh, once again, uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of uh, 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1. We'll be continuing this morning by looking at verses uh, 12 to 15. And I'm calling this morning's message, Established Faith. We've, uh, if you've been with us, we started out with saving faith, and then, then last week we looked at having a, 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 a abounding faith, and now we have an established uh, faith this week. Um, I learned something this week. I guess I'd heard it before. And I guess reading about it again just reminded me of something that kind of uh, hurt my heart a little bit as, as a pastor and as someone who, who, who teaches and, and speaks and, and, and always hopes that people uh, will hear what I say and will retain what I say. Uh, but this uh, I found uh, some, some information that uh, kind of just shocked me. Uh, it, it, says, it says that research has determined that most people forget 90% of what they hear within an hour after they hear it. 90%, all right, 90%, uh, particularly those that uh, uh, when people give a speech or a lecture or, in our case, the sermon, uh, and I think that some of y'all know this already, you, you know yourself, and that's likely why some of y'all take notes. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all know that you're probably going to forget if you don't take notes, and that's a good practice. So they got me to think about, you know, what maybe, what are y'all remembering from the sermons that I preach? What are you taking away uh, from this place? You see, because according to the research, uh, those of you that don't take notes will only have the possibility of remembering 10%. 10% of what I say from this pulpit. You'll, you'll, you'll have forgotten everything else by the time you got done eating lunch. Right? It's already gone. And, and, and we're all guilty of this. Not, not, just, uh, not just you. I'm guilty of this very same thing. And so, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that, that's only true, though. The only way that you can have a possibility of remembering more or retaining more is if you actually pay attention while I'm preaching. Right? If you don't pay attention to while I'm preaching, it could be 0% by the time you even get to your car. So this morning, my question is, how focused are you on hearing from God when you come to church? Right? How focused on you on hearing a word from God? What are you thinking about when you leave here on a typical Sunday morning? Are you, are you just so busy looking around the room and saying and, and trying to remember who wasn't there, right? Who was missing this week? And, I, and, I, and I'll just confess to you, I'm guilty of that as a pastor. I'm looking out here at these pews and I can see who's not here. I see a lot of red, even today. And, my, and if I'm not careful, my mind can start saying, you know, where, who is, where is this person? Or why aren't they here? Or, or what's going on? Why, why are so many people missing this morning? Or maybe you're thinking about what you're going to have for lunch or what ball game you're going to watch on TV, or maybe if you're uh, someone that, that has no time during the week to catch up on your chores, maybe you're thinking about what you can get done once you get home before you come back for discipleship at five, or, or maybe on, on certain days you're, you're thinking about how cold it was in the sanctuary or, or how hot it was, or there's any number of things that you can leave here thinking about, but how often do you leave thinking about what I preached, Right? Think about what I preach. Now, when I say that, I don't mean, you know, not how I preached, right, to critique me or how long I preached, but the content of what I preached. Thinking about those things, the challenges, the exhortations, and the encouragements from the Word of God. You see, how often do you leave church thinking about Jesus? Thinking about Jesus on a whole nother level. How often do you take the sermon with you, is what I'm asking you. This morning, not just, not just in your notes, which is good, but in your head and in your heart. You see, I've been preaching for just a little over four years now, and I'm still learning. I'm still a rookie. I know that I got a lot of room uh, and a lot of areas I need to improve in and grow in. I know that. And as all of you know, I'm, I don't tell many stories and I don't tell jokes. And I will share some personal testimonies and personal stories of how God has worked in my life to help. Uh, to, to emphasize or uh, illustrate a point on the passage that I'm preaching from. And so I'm guessing I'm just one of those wackos that actually believes that the Word of God is enough for the people of God. 
Right? I, I'm one of those weirdos. I'm one of those type of guys. One of those preachers. You see, I'm not here to entertain you. Right? That's not my purpose. That's not my calling. I'm not. I'm here to preach the truth of God's word to you in such a way that you may be established in those truths. That's what my purpose is. That's what I'm here to do. You see, you don't need to hear a word from me when we gather in this place. You don't need to hear Brother Mike. You need to hear a word from God. That's why you are here. From God's Word. That is what we strive to do here week in and week out. You see, the Word of God must be central to everything that we do here. Everything that we do here. But not just here. The Word of God must be central in every area of our lives. Every area of our lives. That's what God intended for His people. That's the way it's always been. That's how we become established in the truth of God's Word. Going all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 to says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, as they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. God's Word must always be for us. We need to be exposing ourselves to the truth of God's Word as often as we can. We can never hear, we can never read God's Word too much. That is simply not possible. Though I would like for us to try. Though I would like for us to try. You see, early Christians were being exposed to all kinds of false teachings. That's what Peter's mainly dealing with in this little short epistle. That Peter wanted to make sure that they were being established in the truth to protect them from being misled or drawn away by those false teachings. You see, we live in a day where there's also false teachings. We live in a day where fake news is the new norm, right? It's the new norm. The, the cat's finally out of the bag. These things have been exposed. And it's hard to know what to believe anymore. It's made us very skeptical of everyone. It's hard to tell who is speaking the truth and who is not. And I'm not just talking about politics. right? And that's not just in politics. It happens in our churches also, even 2,000 years later. But here's the good news. Here's, a, here's something encouraging for you to take away this morning. There is no fake news in the Bible, but there is plenty of good news. Amen? There is plenty of good news. That our hearts and minds need to be established in the truth of God's Word. That's how you develop an established faith. You see, when you are established in the truth of God's Word, the natural result will be that you have an established faith. You have a mature faith, a firm faith. And that was Peter's hope for the church both then and now. Amen? So let's take a look at our passage this morning. These couple of verses. Stand as you as we honor the reading of God's Word together, if you're able. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12-15 to 15. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will all, always be able to remember these things. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for taking the Apostle Peter, stubborn Peter, hard-headed Peter, and using him in such a, a, a tremendous way that you changed his heart, you changed the direction of his life, that you that you grew him into a, a great man, a faithful man, a man that was established in the faith. And he wanted to, that, that the people that would read his letters, the ones he would lead to Christ, the ones he would disciple, he wanted them to have that same established faith. He wants us to have that same established faith too. So God, help us to strive for that. Help us to do the things necessary for us to grow in our faith. Let us not be offended as we are reminded often of your scriptures. Let them not become commonplace to us. Let them always be precious 
in our sight, and in our hearing. Father, change our hearts today. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that we see in our passage is that we all need to be reminded of the truth of God's Word. We all need to be reminded. Often we need to be reminded. Verse 12 says, So I will always remind you of these things. Right? Always remind you of the, these things. And, now, and it's curious that he adds on here. He says, Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. And I know that probably some of you get tired of me preaching some of the same topics. And sometimes you even get tired of me preaching through the same passages over and over again. And maybe you're starting to think that maybe uh, I think that you don't understand. Maybe I, that you're not getting what I'm saying. That, that I, I keep coming back to these same things over and over again. And now that may be true for some of you. Some of y'all might may have a hard time understanding what I'm saying or what the Word of God is teaching us. But, but, but like Peter's saying here, most of you uh, know what I'm saying. Most of you have been exposed to these things for years and years and years. Most of you in this room have been following Jesus for a long time. Some of you have been following Jesus longer than I've been alive. Amen? Right? And so a long, long time. So I'm not telling you anything new. Most of you already know these things. All I'm doing is doing the same thing that Jesus did. All I'm doing is the same thing that Paul did. And as we see here, I'm doing the same thing that Peter did. You see, they were always teaching and preaching the same things over and over and over again. Because you know why? We learn through repetition. We learn through repetition. We keep on hearing these things over and over again. You see, it wasn't primarily because the people that he was, they were preaching to or, or writing to didn't know the truth of God's Word. They knew the truth of God's Word. They needed to hear it. They needed to be reminded of these things. It was to reinforce what they did know by reminding them of the truths that they were already firmly established in, that they'd already hidden those words in their heart. That Paul made, it, it, he said it this way in Philippians 3 1. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. It's safe. It's safe to hear these things over and over again. It's good to hear these same things. By safe, Paul meant that it was helpful, that it was beneficial and that it was needed it was necessary and you see if you think about this if you're if you're married you know why do you keep telling your spouse that you love them right why do you do that why do you keep telling your wife that you love them why do you keep telling your husband that you love them do you do you think they don't know do they not know that you love them especially if you've been married 10 20 30 some of y'all 50 plus years do they not know that you love them sure they do i hope they do but you want to reaffirm them in that, right? And if the Lord has blessed you with children, why do you keep telling them that you love them? It's the same thing. Hopefully it's not because they don't know already, but you keep telling them because you don't want them to ever, ever, ever forget that you love them, especially in a season where you're not able to, especially if you're taking away and you're not able to tell them anymore. They want, you want them to be able to know and look back and say, I know my mama loved me. I know my dad loved me. I know my wife loved me. They told me. They told me. And they kept telling me over and over again. They know. I know. You see, it's quite like these things. The, these things that Peter was reminding the church of extended well beyond what he had previously written in verses 1 to 11. All these things. Right, he wanted them to know. He wanted to make sure they knew. He was reminding them that they were fully loved by God. That they were fully accepted by God. That they were fully forgiven by God. That they were saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Not through these false teachings. Not through these lies that these people were telling. That he was certainly also reminding them that they had been permanently adopted into the family of God. That they were now permanently part of His family. They were sons of and daughters of God. That the Apostle Paul has said like this in Ephesians 1, 3-7. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, who has blessed us, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him 
before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by, the, by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. See, if you read your Bible, if you read the letters of Paul, you know what you're going to hear? You know what you're going to read? This, over and over and over again. Right? Not, not because you don't think the, the people don't know, but they need to be reminded of these things. Nothing else matters more than these truths. We need to apply these things to our lives, hide them away, especially whenever those dark days come. We need to be, remember these things. You see, all of this was theirs and ours through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And I know that most of you know these things already. But as your pastor, it is my responsibility to keep on reminding you of these things. That's what I am here for. And I love what Pastor John MacArthur said in regards to this, this, this verse. He says, all who preach and teach the Scriptures are reminding people of what God has said in His Word so constantly that His repetition meaning God, His repetition and theirs make truth stick. Right? That's what we want. We want it to stick. We want it to, 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 to stick to our hearts and stick to our brains. You see, we all need to be reminded of the truth of God's Word. The second thing that we see in our passage this morning is that we all need to be refreshed by the truth of God's Word. Verse 13, he says, I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. You see, Peter felt it was the right thing for him to do to keep on preaching and teaching the Word of God until he was no longer physically able to do so. You see, in those days, there was no retirement. It wasn't anything about, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach till I'm 60 or 65, and then I'm going to retire, and I'm going to do what everybody else does. I'm going to buy me a condo and go to Florida and pick up seashells the rest of my life. I'm going to hang it up. My career of preaching is done. I've, I've got my retirement settled, and so now it's going to enjoy the rest of my life. Not so. Uh, that's not biblical. And, and that's what we see here with Peter. He didn't shut it down. Over and over again, he kept on speaking those refreshing truths from the Word of God. And I don't know if the rest of y'all have noticed it or not, but, but just normal everyday life is hard. Amen? It's hard. It's hard. And, and, and we live in a fallen world and, and, and there's so many things that uh, affect us in a negative way. In, in a multitude of, multitude of ways over and over again on, on a daily basis. You see, life can be hard. It can be for all of us. People can be cruel. Bad things happen to good people all the time. Peter knew that better than most of us. You see, when then when you add the regular attacks of the adversary, right? The devil, that him and his demons are always uh, trying to trip us up, cause us to, to lose our focus, to make us discouraged. You see, sometimes... Life can be almost intolerable. Has anyone had days like that? Where you just don't know if you can take any more? Where you're just almost just ready to throw in the towel? Has anyone ever had weeks or months like that? Has anyone ever had years like that? Is anyone in the midst of one of those times right now? Right now. Like you're, you're, you're in it. You're not, it's not in the past. Right? It's not years ago. You are right there right now. You're experiencing this. That life is almost intolerable almost unbearable you see peter's solution is to get into the word of god that's his solution to get into the word of god read it study it meditate on it claim those promises see listen listen to it through the preaching and teaching ministries of your church turn off the radio or turn the dial find a a, a good a bible teaching preaching a radio station listen to sermon listen to charles stanley David, Jeremiah, anyone, any one of those godly men, listen to the Word being spoke over you. You see, your time spent under the truth of God's Word will refresh your memory about who you are in Christ and all that He has done for you. That your identity is not found in your circumstances. It's not. Your identity is found in Christ. Your identity is not found in your sin. It's not. Your identity is found in Christ. Your identity is not found in your sickness or your disease or your disability. Your identity is found in Christ. 
that the only way that your circumstances or your past sins can define you is if you let them define you. If you let them define you, let them have power over you because your identity is now found in Christ. You see, anytime I began to, to get worn down or if I began to lose my focus, and uh, you know, not just as a pastor, but as a believer, right? What I tend to do, I, I always turn to the book of Galatians. We've been in there in Sunday school for this last this quarter, and it's been so encouraging for me to I, I love that, that that short book. But the, but this one verse has really always uh, touched my heart and it always refreshes me. Galatians 2.20, right? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In a life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's the truth. That's the truth about who I am. That's the truth about who Christ is in me. He loves me. He gave Himself for me. Right? If, the, if, the, if God be for me, who can be against me? Amen? That's the kind of truth that we need to have uh, uh, sowed in our hearts to be refreshed with this type of truth. You see, if you've repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, your identity is ultimately found in Christ alone and nothing else. Not to say that it's good to say I'm a mama or a papa or I'm a son or I'm a father or I'm a policeman or I'm a teacher or I'm a preacher or whatever. Great. That's that's not that's what you do. That's not who you are. You understand? That's not your identity. Your identity is in Christ. That He is the one that loved you so much that He gave Himself for you so that your sins could be forgiven and that you could have everlasting life. You see, let that refreshing truth refocus you and re-energize your faith this morning. You see, I would say that there's many, many, many good resources out there. There are many good and helpful books out there by Christian authors. Lifeway has shelves full of them. But nothing has the power or the ability to refresh your memory and establish your faith like the Word of God. Amen? There is no substitute. There is no rival to the Word of God. And Paul knew this well. As he was locked away in a Roman dungeon awaiting his execution, he was able to either write or have someone write what we know as the, the letter, or the second letter to Timothy. Right? That was the last thing that Paul wrote. He was cold, he was alone, and undoubtedly a, a bit discouraged as anyone would be uh, in that situation. And he could have asked for anything. Right? Anything. He could have asked for anything or anyone in that final letter that, to his young pastor friend. And I'm certain that Timothy would have brought it to him if he was, uh, was able to do so. But you know what Paul asked for? You know what he asked for? If you've, if you've read this letter, you know where I'm going with this. He asked for a coat and his copies of the Scriptures. That's what he wanted. A dead man waiting execution. He wanted a coat. He wanted the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 4.13 says, Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. And the books, especially the parchments. He wanted his Bible. He wanted the Scriptures. He wanted the Word of God. The coat was to give warmth to his body. The Scriptures were to give warmth to his soul. To give warmth to his soul. You see, that's what the Word of God does. It brings times of refreshing when our bodies grow tired and our souls grow weary. You see, we all need to be refreshed by the truth of God's Word from time to time. The third and final thing that we see in our passage this morning is that we all need to remember the truth of God's Word. Remember the truth of God's Word. Verses 14 and 15 says, Because I know that I will soon put it, put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. This is an odd passage. It's a strange thing to hear Peter say this. He knew that his life was coming to an end. Right? He knew it. Right? We aren't told exactly how he knew, but we do know that it was Jesus himself that let him know. And this probably wasn't a surprise to, to Peter, if I had to guess. Right? That Jesus had already told him in the manner of his, uh, of his death as he was restored, uh, restoring him after his resurrection in John's Gospel. If you remember back to the uh, do you love me passage, right? If you, do you love me, right? Uh, feed my sheep passage. And, excuse me, in John's uh, John chapter 21, 
uh, verses 18 and 19. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, talking to Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and, will, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. All right, so he had known this. Peter, or Jesus had told Peter this. So Jesus allowed Peter to live roughly another 40 years. That Peter made tremendous use of those four decades by being faithful to the Great Commission, right? to equipping the saints and teaching and preaching the truth of God's word. Tradition holds that Peter was martyred for his faith under Emperor Nero. Some of y'all probably know this already. But, but what you may not know is that he asked to be crucified upside down. That's what the church tradition tells us. He wanted to be crucified upside down. He did not feel he was worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they obliged him. They obliged him to do it that way. You see, we could all learn a lot from how Peter lived out his final days. You see, his bucket list didn't look nothing like what ours would, that most of ours would if we knew that we had only weeks or months left to live. Right? He didn't make plans to go to the places he never got to go to. He didn't go to the Grand Canyon. He didn't grow to, to go to Paris and see the Apple Tower. He didn't go see the world's largest ball of yarn. Right? None of those things. He didn't make plans to experience all the things that he hadn't got to experience. He didn't resign from ministry and just enjoy what time he had left with his family. Now, I do believe that he made every effort to spend time with those close to him, but not for the same reasons that we would. Right? Not for the same reasons that we would. Peter was, inter was not interested in sentimentality. He was interested in making sure that the church, that his family, that his friends all knew the truth of God's Word. That's what his focus was. That's what he wanted most for them. Peter was focused on discipleship until the day that he died. In other words, Peter was focused on making sure that the believers that he would be leaving behind would remember the truth of God's Word. Right? To remember those things. He wanted them to have an established faith, not a weak or shallow faith that could be manipulated or, 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 or the people could be led astray. You see, to Peter... That was the most important thing that he could pass on. That was the most important thing that he could leave behind for those that he cared for the most. You see, that's the most important thing that I can pass on to you as your pastor also. That's the most important thing that a Christian parent can pass on to their children. That's the most important thing that a Christian grandparent can pass on to their grandchildren. Not a set of golf clubs, not a set of coins, not a set of stamps, not this heirloom chair or whatever the case is that's all fine and dandy but your duty your calling your responsibility your obligation to the next generation to your children and grandchildren is to invest and pour the word of god into their lives that's what they need that's what they need more than those things see peter was concerned with them remembering he wanted everyone to be able to remember christ and his words that some scholars believe that verse 15 is a reference to what we know as the Gospel of Mark. Right? That's what they're thinking of. That, 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 that's what he, uh, kind of a reference to that. It's widely accepted that Mark, uh, Mark's Gospel is based off of the eyewitness accounts of Peter. Uh, that John Mark was his disciple uh, and interpreter is what many believe. Uh, he said that, that he would make every effort to make sure that the church would be able to remember the truth of God's Word after he was gone. And I would say that he kept up his end of the deal because we have two of his letters in our canon of Scripture and also the Gospel of Mark because of his efforts. Amen? That he kept up his end of the deal and we have those things before us now. So why is it so important that we remember what the Bible says? Why does that matter so much? I'll just let the unnamed psalmist of 119 and the Apostle Paul answer that question. For us, they can do it better than I can. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's why. That's why we must remember the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, 
for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why. That's why it's so important for us to remember these things. In other words, we all need to remember the truth of God's Word so that we can know how to live a life that is pleasing to God. See, we all need to remember the truth of God's Word. So this morning, as we conclude, as we wrap up our time together, you see, now you have a little better grasp of why I preach the way that I do. I know that some of y'all don't care for it and you don't understand the, the methodology that I use, but now you know. It's not because I don't think you don't understand what I'm saying. It's because I want to add to and reinforce what you already know. I want to make sure that you know what you believe and why you believe it. That's what my purpose is. That's what my calling is to you. I want you to have an established faith. Just like Peter. I want you to have an established faith. I want you to have a a strong faith that is informed by the truth of God's Word. Not by tradition and not just by men's opinions. And I agree wholeheartedly with this quote by Warren Wiersbe, what he said. He says, we do not depend on the traditions of dead men. We depend on the truth of the living Word. Men die, but the Word lives forever. The Word lives forever that Peter would give Mr. Wiersbe a hearty Galilean amen on that quote, I'm sure. That we all have room to grow in our faith, don't we? Don't we all have room to grow, room to improve? There's always more for us to learn from God's Word. And there isn't any new truth to be revealed outside of God's Word, but there is always more truth to be revealed as we dig into God's Word more and more and more. Amen. Every time we open this book, He shows us something new. That whether you would say that you have an established faith already or that you are striving to have an established faith, Peter's words are the same for all of us. They still all of, apply to all of us in the same way that we all need to be reminded of the truth of God's Word. We all need to be refreshed by the truth of God's Word. We all need to, to remember the truth of God's Word. Right? So once before, before we go, parents, what are you passing on to your children? What are you passing on to your children? Grandparents in this room, what are you passing on to your grandchildren? You see, the truth of God's Word is what they need more than anything else you could ever give them. And here's why. If God's Word doesn't matter to you, it won't matter to them either. You will reap as you sow. Amen? Let's pray and we'll have a time to respond as the Lord burdens your heart. God, we thank You for this day. We thank You for the preservation of Your Word. We thank You for as citizens of of this nation, at least to this point, we are free to assemble and gather as your church without fear of persecution. We all uh, have access uh, to your word, numerous copies of the actual physical Bible, the paper, the ink. We also have uh, access to digital copies through technology on our phones, on our computers. God, help us to to, to, to not take that access for granted. God, thank you for the, the precious gift that we have in your word. Thank you for faithful men. Thank you for faithful women. Thank you for faithful teenagers. Thank you for faithful children that are, are diligent and hungry for your word. God, I pray that, that, that you would continue to, to establish their faith, not in men, Not in traditions, not in places, but in the truth of your word. God, we love you, we praise you, and we want to be able to live a life that is honoring to you and glorifying to you. God, move our hearts, encourage our hearts. God, do a work in us today. Let us leave here differently than when we came in. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.